the organizers, I really appreciate it. It's a great honor. Um, so with with that, we're going to switch gears a little bit and I'll tell you about some of the work that we've been doing for several years now. And then some of the more current work that we've been doing um, concerning methylation and the thionine work. And so we're going to talk more about mice this, this whole talk. And um, someday we'd like to learn how to apply some of these things or translate this information to humans if, if possible. And so any ideas that people have, please uh, please let me know. So we're going to really focus on growth hormone and the thionine. So the mouse that um, Sven was referring to is the dwarf mouse here on your right. And this animal um, lives three to four years in comparison to a wild type animal that lives two years. These animals are diminutive in size, so they're, they're smaller, they're about a third of the body weight of a normal mouse. Um, and then they have some other characteristics which, which I'll describe as we go through um, the talks. So I just want to thank the people in my laboratory first for moving over. <laughs> so thank the people in the laboratory first um, for all the hard work that they do, specifically Charlene Ricosi, who's the technician in the laboratory, has been with me for 15 years, and she's my right-hand person. Andre Barkey gave me the animals when I left as a postdoc, um, which was very fortunate. And then an individual named Eric Uthis, who was at our USDA Human Nutrition Center that got us started with the methionine work. Um, and then a, a current collaboration that's going on is with Peter Adams at the University of Glasgow. So he's helping us with methylate, the meth DNA methylation work. And as Ben mentioned, we've got support from a variety of different um, sources. So what our laboratory has been interested in over the last um, 15 years or so is mechanisms of stress resistance or cellular defense and how those might relate to aging, aging processes, and longevity. <clears throat> Again, we've been using growth hormone mutant mice, not only the Ames dwarf, but also we've been using uh, growth hormone transgenic animals, which I'll introduce to you in a couple of minutes, and also have been using a growth hormone receptor knockout, which I'll talk a little bit about um, later on in the talk. And we've been really interested in metabolism, primarily. So we know that these animals are smaller, and they don't have growth hormones, so that that drive or the, to grow or the demand to grow is much less or much lower in these animals. And we believe that with this reduced somatotropic signaling, mm -hmm. that the resources that are normally used for growth, specifically amino acids and proteins, are shifted more towards stress resistance or cellular defense um, in the case of these animals. And this helps them to live much longer. We've also been looking into some epigenetic mechanisms. We think this metabolic reprogramming may shift their epigenetic or <coughs> genome um, may be maintained better than wild type animals. So this is just a little bit of background first on growth hormone to get everyone caught up to speed. So growth hormone is produced in your anterior pituitary and it's under the control of two hormones in the hypothalamus that stimulate or inhibit the release of growth hormone. And it's the balance of these two hormones that determine how much is released. The growth hormone released from the anterior pituitary um, acts primarily at the level of the liver in terms of your, um, stimulating IGF-1 for somatic growth, but it also affects many other tissues, um, including muscle, cartilage, bone, uh, fat, and some tissues that aren't listed here, and has um, major metabolic effects on the system. So people think about growth hormone primarily as a, as a growth hormone that stimulates somatic growth, but it has a lot of metabolic effects too that are often ignored. So this is just a, a table, that, um, just to show you that there's a lot of different growth hormone mutants that people are using in, ter in mice in the aging research. So the Ames dwarf, the one that we primarily use, is listed at the top. It's uh, a phenotypically identical animal called the Snell dwarf. Um, is shown next, it also has a long life, and it has increased stress resistance. So if you look at the two common things among these um, animal models that I've listed is that they have longer lives in comparison to their wild type controls. And they also, most, all, almost all of them have increased stress resistance. So it seems that um, an increase in longevity goes hand in hand with increased stress resistance. And, and people have measured stress resistance in lots of different ways. And I'll talk a little bit about that. So a little for, more formal introduction of the Ames Dwarf. So these animals have a point mutation in a gene that drives differentiation of the pituitary gland. 
So they're actually missing three different hormones. Um, they, don't, they don't have the somatotrope cells that produce growth hormone, lactotropes that produce prolactin, or the thyrotropes that produce thyroid stimulating hormone. Um, again, I mentioned before their lifespan has increased 50 to about 50 to 70 percent. That's in males and females respectively. Um, these animals have very enhanced insulin sensitivity, um, enhanced stress resistance, as I've mentioned, and enhanced spatial learning and memory. <clears throat> and just to contrast those animals that are long living with animals that have too much growth hormone. So um, years ago growth hormone transgenic animals were developed that overexpress, this particular line overexpresses bovine growth hormone, which is only one amino acid different from human. Um, and this overexpressing animal has very high levels of growth hormone produced, but they have a lifespan of 50% of their wild type. So they live to about 12 months of age on average, whereas the wild type lives two years of age. Because of the effects of growth hormone on metabolism, these animals are hyperinsulinemic because growth hormone um, raises blood glucose levels. So they not only have high glucose, they have high insulin. Um, they have a very low or a decreased uh, stress resistance, low levels of cellular defense, and they have impaired levels of spatial learning and memory. So the growth hormone deficient mice, the Ames mice, have longer health spans. So we're much more interested. Um, in human work is, is versus longevity as to increase health span. So in terms of health span, the incidence of cancer is reduced in the Ames dwarf. Fatal disease develops much later in these animals when compared to their wild type controls. They maintain youthful cognition. So cognition in mice is kind of an interesting word. <laughs> but um, we have looked at spatial learning and memory, and we find that, that uh, they, they maintain youthful levels of spatial learning and memory well out past um, the wild type um, levels. And if you insult the animals with something that knocks out neurons in the brain, specifically in the hippocampus, where spatial learning and memory originates, um, you can, these animals still maintain their ability to um, learn and remember things and compare it better than um, wild type animals. The immune system aging is delayed in these animals. They have um, fewer cataracts at the same age as a wild type, so they develop cataracts much later. Um, in terms of extracellular matrix and collagen, their collagen aging is delayed. Uh, the glomerular basement membrane thickening in the kidney um, stays, it stays very thin, the membranes stay very thin, so it thickens much later in comparison to wild type. And joint cartilage and the development of osteoarthrosis is delayed in these animals. So there's a variety of age-related processes that we think about in older people that seem to be delayed in these animals. In contrast, the animals that only live half as long, the growth hormone transgenics, they have an increased incidence of cancer, primarily um, hepatic type cancers and lymphomas and mammary cancer. Fatal disease develops very early in life for these animals. Um, and they undergo early reproductive senescence, so by six months of age, they're no longer breeding. And then similarly, or opposite of the dwarf, but similar systems, the immune system age, aging is, seems to be altered. Um, collagen aging, basement membrane thickening, and joint cartilage um, processes are all accelerated in these animals. So we've been using these two animal models throughout the last several years to compare and contrast how they age um, with various different um, assays and things. And so this is just to bring up a little bit about human work. I think it was mentioned earlier that calorie restriction delays aging and, and, uh, and decreases cancer. We also know that in a population um, in Ecuador, um, a population that's been studied by Jaime Aguirre and uh, Walter Longo, these individuals have growth hormone receptor deficiency or larin um, dwarfism. And they're pictured here. And then with Jaime again several years later, so these um, people have very, very low levels of IGF-1, which is that downstream of growth hormone, and they have no cancer and no diabetes. So um, it's very exciting in terms of human um, physiology that if you reduce growth or reduce growth hormone signaling, because these people have an altered receptor, and reduce IGF-1 to, to very, very low levels, IGF-1 and IGF-2, that you can prevent diabetes and cancer.
So back to cellular resistance and stress, um, cellular defense and stress resistance. There's a lot of different ways that you can think about and study cellular defense. So there's, there's scavenging systems we think primarily as far as antioxidant defense, detoxification, um, repair systems, um, metal chelation, I think that was mentioned earlier a little bit, heat shock proteins, apoptosis. There's lots of different things you can pick one. Um, and study it intensively. <coughs> we know that these systems are tissue specific and we know that growth hormone status or the levels of growth hormone concentrations in the, in the blood significantly affect all of these systems. So we um, focused primarily um, several years ago where it was on, uh, but the focus was antioxidant defense. So we had shown that catalase and superoxide dismutase and, and um, glutathione peroxidase these different enzymes were upregulated in the dwarf mouse. That led us to look at liver glutathione levels. And so glutathione is just a tripeptide, small, small molecule. Um, and these levels were much higher in the dwarf across age groups. So it's, whether we looked at 3 months, 12 months, 24 months, the dwarf mouse tended to have higher levels of liver glutathione. This is the reduced form. There's an oxidized form called glutathione disulfide, <coughs> or GSSG. The levels of the, the oxidized form were also higher in these animals, giving them a total glutathione content higher than the wild type animals. So um, we decided at that point to start looking at, at uh, glutathione metabolism. So we looked at the enzymes that, that, that are involved in the biosynthesis of glutathione, in addition to enzymes that utilize glutathione, the glutathione as transferases for detoxification, and GPX, and then GGT, which is gamma glutamyl transpeptidase. This is an um, enzyme found um, in the liver and kidney primarily, and this enzyme breaks down glutathione so to, into its components so it can be reutilized, uh, the components can be reutilized again, primarily cysteine. So we found that the biosynthetic enzyme, this is the rate limiting one, was increased in the animals. And in addition, the enzymes that utilize glutathione were upregulated, and the enzyme that breaks it down was decreased, suggesting that the levels of glutathione were higher because of more biosynthesis and less um, degradation. And again, this is uh, in generalities, but this is in the liver. And then we also found that if you gave growth hormone back to um, these animals, that you would decrease um, the biosynthetic enzyme, you decrease the GSTs and GPX. And this is just an example of a different tissue other than liver, so I'll talk primarily about liver um, today. But in the kidney, the GST levels are also very high. So again, these are, it's a huge family of proteins that are used to detoxify various compounds. So we looked a little bit further, actually a lot further, and I'm just giving you a little piece of the data here at the GST. So it's a huge family of enzymes, the glutathione is transferases. Many of them have substrate specificities. Um, this is just an example of message expression for two of the alpha class, alpha 1 and alpha 4. You can see that the levels are much higher in the dwarf, which are in blue, and the wild type are in red. For both of these, um, sub, or for both of these uh, family members, the mu class, um, theta, omega, zeta, and kappa, they're all much higher in the dwarf in comparison to the wild type. The only class of GST that's lower is GST pi. <clears throat> Everything else is higher. And then if you did, if we have, um, we performed uh, substrate specific activity assays because message level doesn't always mean a whole lot if it's not, um, if you don't see increases in protein and activity. We can also show you that in animals that receive saline in the dwarf, they had higher levels of GST um, that's specific for, for HNE. And if you give growth hormone, you decrease it again. We found this um, same finding for other substrate specific GST activities. So it's not just for this particular one. So it suggests that the GSTs are upregulated in the animal in terms of activity and that you can knock that activity back down again with growth hormone. So we were had looked at glutathione and we're trying to understand the differences in glutathione and started working with an individual at the USDA named Eric Uthis who suggested that we start looking start looking at amino acid metabolism <clears throat> and it's particularly methionine because it's essential for glutathione synthesis. So we um, 
with his help, we started to look at some of the enzymes that are involved in the metabolism of methionine, and knowing also that methionine is, uh, produces acidenosyl methionine, or SAM, which is the major methyl donor in mammals. So this confusing slide, kind of busy, it just um, gives you just a, a picture, a brief, kind of a brief picture, a simple picture of methionine metabolism. So I haven't included the whole folate pathway over here because it just gets too busy. Um, but we also see changes in the folate pathway. So in the Ames mice, these are each of the enzymes involved in, in the metabolism of methionine down to homocysteine and then down to cysteine for glutathione synthesis. And we see that each of those enzymes along that pathway are highly upregulated, um, anywhere from 50 to 200 percent in the Ames mice. And this represents activity levels. We've also looked at message and protein, and they confirm these changes in activity. So everything is upregulated in terms of that um, particular pathway. And then homocysteine can take two, can go one of two directions. It can be um, irreversibly, you know. Uh, go down the transsulfuration pathway here, or it, the homocysteine can be recycled back to methionine um, via methyl, uh, methionine synthase. And we found that this enzyme is particularly low in the dwarf in comparison to the wild type. If we add growth hormone back to these animals again for a week and then measure the enzymes again after that, we find that it decreases the expression of these enzymes. So again, it suggests that the lack of growth hormone, with a lack of growth hormone, get an upregulation in methionine metabolism. So then we looked at our other animal model that I mentioned to you earlier, the growth hormone transgenic. Again, these animals only live half as long as their wild type. And you can see that the growth hormone transgenic, the levels of those enzymes are decreased. So we can take a growth hormone deficient animal, provide growth hormone, downregulate that system, you can also take an animal model that has already has a ton of growth hormone um, floating around, and it, you can depress the system um, the same way. In addition, the growth hormone transgenics have decreased G, uh, GPX. They have lower GST also, so they're not very good at detoxification. And they have higher levels of the enzyme that breaks glutathione down. So the glutathione that is produced is around, uh, not, it's not around as long as in So we um, started to change gears a little bit in terms of metabolism and started to look at DNA methylation. So we knew the methionine pathway wasn't operating normally in the dwarf mouse. Normally, when methionine is abundant, transsulfuration is favored. So you take homocysteine, and it's converted to cystothionine and then broken down to cysteine. But when methionine is low, transmethylation is favored. So you get more um, uh, methylation reactions going on. In the dwarf, we found that both of these, um, both of these pathways are upregulated. So we did a flux, a flux um, study. You inject radioactive tracers and then collect tissues after so many minutes and look at um, what's left <coughs> in those tissues. And we found that the methyl moiety of the car and the carbon chain were lost much faster in the dwarf mouse in comparison to the wild type. So it suggests that methionine was fluxing much faster through that animal in comparison to the wild type. So um, I already mentioned to you that acidenosyl methionine is important for DNA methylation, and we found that acidenosyl methionine and its um, downstream component acidenosyl homocysteine, that ratio is altered in the Ames mouse. And I also told you that, told you that SAM is a universal methyl donor, and 95% of all the acidenosyl methionine produced is used for methylation and most of it occurs in the liver. So it suggested, um, knowing Sam's role as far as methyl donation and DNA methylation, methyl donation and DNA methylation, we were guessing that there might be epigenetic differences in these animals that help, may help maintain its long life. So to start, we, we um, go back to enzyme assays because that's uh, what the laboratory got very good at over the years, and we started to look at the DNA methyl transferases. And so there's there's a couple of different DNA methyl transferases. There's DNMT1, which I've got a little note down here, is primarily um, utilized for maintenance of methylation, and DNMT3A and 3B are used for de novo methylation. 
although there's cross-reactivity between the two. So we looked at message expression for DNNT1 and 3A. We didn't see any differences in 3B, so I don't have that on here. And we found that the, in, in general, and primarily at three months of age, that the dwarf mouse um, exhibits a higher level of DNNT message expression, um, DNNT1 and DNNT3A in comparison to their wild type control. <coughs> When we looked at protein, we've got a, a somewhat of a different picture. DNMT1 protein is extremely low in the dwarf mouse. We um, have tried this several different times and uh, have not been able to pick up on much protein present, even though the, the message expression is high. But DNMT3A follows a very similar pattern. So it's high at three months, not much change at um, 12 months, and it tends to be a little bit lower at 24 months. So ultimately, again, message and protein are meaningful, but activity is what um, is, is the best thing to look at it, as far as I'm concerned. So we looked at DNMT activity, and the problem right now is the DNMT activity assays are not specific for one type of DNMT or the other. It's a, it, um, you can only measure overall DNMT activity at this point. Mm -hmm. So we looked at that, and we found that indeed the activity was higher in the animals at three months of age and then it tends to be a little bit lower by 24 months of age, <clears throat> which um, looks very similar to the dnmt 3 a since we're not have, we don't have a protein, we don't believe there's a protein um, contributing to that activity as far as dnmt one is concerned. So since we're endocrinologists, we also like to give growth hormone back in a deficient system. So here's dnmt um, <clears throat> one um, protein, message expression and protein. When you give growth hormone to um, dwarf animals that don't have growth hormone, you increase the DNMT1 uh, message expression and you increase the protein expression. So here again, the dwarf has very low levels of DNMT1 protein, but you add growth hormone and that increases the level of the protein. The opposite is found for DNMT3A. You can see at the protein level, that you, if you, once you give growth hormone, you decrease the levels of, of DNMT3A. So it, it suggests that the DNMTs may be under um, partial regulation also by growth hormone, similar to some of the other methyltransferases we've looked at. We've looked at um, glycine and methyltransferase and, and uh, betaine and um, methyltransferase, and they're also altered by um, adding, removing and adding growth hormone. So ultimately, since we had differences in methyl the DNA methylation enzymes, the ultimate, or the ultimate measure would be to see if there's any differences in methylation. Um, and even though this is not a particularly exciting slide or result, um, it does show differences. So at between 3 and 12 months of age, the dwarf mice tend to have higher levels of DNA methylation. And this is a global assay looking at DNA methylation in the liver. It represents 10 to 13 percent differences. Again, in terms of biology, it's not all that exciting to have a, a small increase. But when you talk, when I've talked to the people, primarily in the cancer field, when you see differences of 10 to 10 to 20 percent in methylation, it can be have huge differences. So some of this we're trying to uh, hone in on a little bit more, and I'll show you a little bit of that data. We've also looked at um, um, the signs and lines and some of these. Uh, um, interspersed repeats, which are huge chunks of DNA throughout the system, and we see differences in the lines and signs in terms of their methylation also. So we have an ongoing study with Peter um, Adams at, at the University of Glasgow, and we sent um, young and old dwarf and wild type um, liver tissue, or liver DNA, to BGI to be sequenced for a methylation sequence um, to be performed, and the data went directly to Peter because I don't have bioinformatics where I'm at, and we couldn't deal with the data set. So he's been providing us some of the um, data um, slowly but surely, and what I, I can tell you, I'll show you a little bit of it um, in, glo in a global sense, nothing that specific at this point. So what we do know is that the old wild type mice and the old dwarf mice tend to be hypomethylated in comparison to the young animals. And this has been shown, this is one of the um, one of the things that's been shown consistently in aging research that anybody that's looking at methylation, if they look between young and old, 
they'll see a loss of methylation or a hypomethylation occurring. So this was, this was to be expected. But they also showed that the young and the old dwarf mice tend to be hypermethylated compared to the wild type. So this potential increase in DNA methylation enzymes may be maintaining that epigenome um, better or in a more stable fashion in the dwarf compared to the wild type. So we know that old wild type animals also lose methylation at regions that are retained in the dwarf. And the dwarfs seem to be better at keeping their CPG islands hyp or hypomethylated. Um, and again, we're, we're following up on some of this in a more specific way, but right now it appears that they maintain a more stable methylation pattern throughout their life in comparison to a wild type. So this is some of the data that, um, that we've been getting so far um, from Peter's lab. And they've looked at a variety of different things. So right now, we're, again, we're just looking at more of a global picture and not gene-specific pictures at this point. And so what we do know is that the wild type animals seem to have a higher number and larger um, size, a larger size of the heterogeneous regions um, throughout the liver DNA when they're lined up against the dwarf. So you can see that the young and old dwarf have less compared to the young and old um, wild type. Um, in addition, you have the dwarf here on the left and the wild type on the right, who's called normal in this case. The normal mice have more, more of both hyper and hypomethylated heterogeneous regions, which is a little confusing, but again, it just it suggests that the dwarf is maintaining more stable methylation pattern in comparison to the wild type. This is some more um, information looking at specific genomic features, and I apologize, it's really small, um, but it, basically it's looking at um, a variety of different regions looking at exons, introns, uh, CPG islands, CPG shores, CPG uh, resorts, they call them now, the lines, some of the signs, LTRs. It's a variety of different genomic features. If you just look, this is the wild type animal, and if you laid it on top of the dwarf animal, you can see it's a similar but a different pattern between the two of them. And these are the things that we're investigating closer now, actually. We're looking at some of these specific differences um, between the dwarf and the wild type without looking at specific genes yet. And then these are hypermethylated regions. And you can see that there's a two-fold difference in the number of hypermethylated regions. So there's increased numbers of hypermethylated regions in the, in the wild type in comparison to the dwarf. So, those few slides looking at, or just trying to look at a more global picture of methylation initially before we go into the gene specific differences, because gene specific differences in methylation may or may not be impactful. And so, at this point, anyway, a single gene as difference in methylation, besides being turned on or off potentially. So, we're trying to look at a more global view at this point. So, now I'm going to switch the last part of the talk will be talk, uh, to tell you a little bit more about methionine um, in terms of, of the diet itself at vers versus metabolism. So someone else has mentioned earlier this morning that calorie restriction extends lifespan. Um, in rodents, in some rodents, it may or may not in non-human primates. I think there's a couple different studies. One says that there's no change, one says that there is a change. Um, but we also know that protein restriction and methionine restriction can extend lifespan and increase health span um, in rodents in particular and some other species. We also know that if you reduce calories in the diet, you're also, you automatically reduce methionine intake. Um, and, uh, and so some people years ago, um, uh, Norman Orentreich at the Orentreich Found Foundation in 1993 published that if you restrict methionine in rats, that you get an increase in lifespan. And then that work's been repeated by Rich Miller's work um, mid 2000, like 2005 or so. We also knew, know from the cancer literature that methyl deficient diets induce liver in, in injury, and if there's any genetic defects in the methionine pathway, they tend to be associated with age related pathologies. So, cal uh, calorie restriction, protein restriction, and methionine restriction are associated with increased resistance to cellular stress. And we know that methionine metabolism is central to methylation and redox buffering processes. So we decided to use, to 
repeat the methionine restriction studies in an animal model that's already very long living and in a short living animal model, our, our aims and our growth from transgenic animals. And so that's what's laid out here. So we did two studies, a long-term lifespan study and a short-term study of about eight weeks um, in length, where we provided these three different animal models, three different levels of, of methionine. <coughs> So we provided a restricted level, so the other reports in the literature suggest that if you reduce methionine by about 80%, that you will get lifespan extension. So we did that, we gave 0.16% methionine. We also reduced methionine just by 50% to see um, if it would be a little bit easier in terms of human translation just to decrease your methionine a little bit versus a restricted diet such as this. And then we also gave enriched methionine. So we know from literature too that if high methionine diets are toxic, so we um, kept it below two times the level, which is where the toxicity shows up at two to five times. We went to a 50% increase or an enriched amount of methionine in the diet at 1.3%. And so we provided these diets to the Ames dwarf in their wild type beginning at eight weeks of age. The growth hormone receptor knockout, which I mentioned to you earlier, it's a less confounded animal model, so it has a it's, it's a Laren dwarf, so that, the, that population of Ecuadorian individuals um, has a growth hormone receptor. Um, they're not knocked out, but they have a, an issue with their receptor, so they don't respond to growth hormone. These animals are also cannot respond to growth hormone. And then the growth hormone transgenics that I mentioned to you earlier that only live about 50% longer. So this is just some body weight data from these animals. Um, we know that if you restrict methionine in the dwarf, or if you, by 80%, 50%, or even enriched um, level at 50% above, we don't get any significant changes in body weight in the Ames dwarf. And in comparison, you see differences in body weight in the wild type animals. So the wild type animals lost a little bit of weight. Um, they were about half a gram uh, lighter, which is, uh, but maintained that weight over six weeks or eight weeks, excuse me. Whereas if you give a little bit higher methionine, you saw an increase in body weight in these animals between eight weeks and 16 weeks. Um, the growth hormone transgenics and the wild type of the growth hormone transgenics both responded similarly. They both maintained their weight for the most part on the methionine restricted diet, but both, part, both uh, genotypes gained weight when you added more methionine to the diet. It's not that exciting. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> we also looked at IGF-1 levels. So, we already know that the dwarf mouse doesn't have any IGF-1. The levels in serum are nearly undetectable. Um, but, in normal animals, given methionine, or restricted um, methionine, IGF levels drop. So, you can see the dwarf in the black. The dwarf already has much lower levels of IGF-1 in comparison. But in the wild type animals, you see a drop between 1.3, 0 0.43, and 0 0.16. So this was, um, that finding was basically validating what's been done in the past in terms of wildlife or wild type animals. Um, and then the plasma IGF-1 levels in the growth hormone transgenic are exactly opposite. So since they have such high growth hormone impacting uh, the liver, IGF-1 production is significantly increased even when methionine is restricted. So they still they have higher levels at the 1.3%, but it decreases um, as you reduce methionine. And similarly, the wild type of this strain decreases under methionine restriction. So I was glad somebody else brought up uh, metabolomics earlier today. Um, so we also have done some metabolomic type data, or generated some meta metabolomic type, type data with metabolon in the U.S. And um, this is, we just submitted this for publication, so we're hoping that someone else is interested. Um, so we looked at methionine metabolism in these animals um, in terms of both metabolites and um, in terms of the enzymes that we've measured previously. So the metabolites are in the solid bars. The dwarf is always the pair on the left, and the wild type is the pair on the right. The red is methionine restriction, and the blue is the methionine enrichment. We didn't do the uh, middle level. And then the, 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 um, the other bars, the ones that are not solid, the open bars in the colors, are the enzyme levels that are uh, 
that are, fall between these substrates. So it's, some, it's the enzyme that catalyzes the, the metabolism of these. So when we look at methionine levels in particular, um, oh, one more thing to tell you is that the crosses represent a genotype difference between diets. So in this particular case, methionine is lower in the dwarf compared to the wild type. And then the asterisks represent a diet difference. So I'll go, I'm going to go through this fairly quickly, but that's, that's the, ba the, ba the basics to understand this particular graph. So in terms of methionine itself, the dwarf mouse maintains their methionine level regardless of the intake. So whether they're restricted in methionine or if they're getting a rich diet, they maintain the same levels of methionine. In comparison, the wild type animal has a much higher level of methionine um, in the restricted case. And this is because of the enzymes that are involved um, respond, there's allosteric responses of these different enzymes to the amount of substrate availability. And from what we understand from the, the other assays and things that we've been running with these animals, is that the, these animals, when they're restricted in methionine, all the, and the uh, methionine conserving enzymes get upregulated to try to keep that level high. So when you look at methionine, it's metabolized to S adenosyl methionine by MAT1A or M adenosyl, uh, M, or methionine and adenosyl transferase. The levels of this enzyme are naturally higher in the dwarf um, on a normal diet, but they're also higher in the dwarf on a methionine restricted or a methionine enriched diet. <clears throat> and then you have uh, the pathway goes from SAM to S adenosyl methionine, you can see that the, uh, the diet in this, there's no genotype effect, but the diet has a significant effect. When there's less methionine around, you have increased levels of SAM. So I won't take you through all of this because um, there's just not enough time, but uh, this is a methyl, another methyl transferase that I mentioned to you earlier. You can see there's a genotype of effect in the enriched diet, but not on the restricted diet. Um, and what we found overall with a lot of these substrates is that the dwarf doesn't change much in terms of a diet difference. So they don't respond to methionine restriction or methionine enrichment in the way that a wild type animal does. And if you had more time, you could, you could see that. <laughs> I could show you lots more. This is transsulfuration. So this is from homocysteine down to cysteine. You can see similar things that the dwarf maintains higher levels of the enzymes. Um, within this system in comparison to the wild type, especially the cystathionase here. Um, uh, what was I going to say? But homocysteine, cystathionine, and cysteine, there's, um, with these two in particular, there's not a lot in terms of genotype difference or diet difference. Cystathionine tends to be lower in the dwarf, even though the levels of the enzyme are much, much higher. And then this is glutathione again. So the animals maintain a higher glutathione even in the presence of less methionine in comparison to a wild type. So as I said, this, date, this data has just been submitted, so we hope that they accept it. And then the last thing I'll mention is the lifespan studies. So again, the early work showed that methionine restriction increased lifespan in wild type animals and, and both mice and rats. And so we also provided these three diets to those uh, the three different mutant mice and their wild type controls. And we found up here, this is the 0.16 where the methionine restriction doesn't impact lifespan, either median lifespan or maximal lifespan um, in the Ames dwarf mouse. In comparison, um, oh and the reason that it, well, what happens here is that the, the wild type is usually sitting back here but methionine restriction did impact the wild type. So it brought it up to the level of the dwarf, but it didn't alter the dwarf lifespan. So that's why there's no difference. Um, but when we only reduce methionine by 50%, you can see that the Ames dwarf that's in blue is still is exhibiting its extension in lifespan, and the 50% decrease in methionine didn't really impact lifespan in the wild type. And similarly, when you give an enriched diet, <coughs> the 1.3% dwarf mice still live longer than the wild type um, in comparison. In terms of the growth hormone receptor knockout, so these animals live 40 to 50% longer um, than their wild type control. They also did not respond to the methionine restriction um, 
and but, but the wild types found an extension. So that again, they didn't show any difference in median or maximum lifespan. So it's suggested to us, at least, at least with these two animal models, if you impact or reduce growth hormone signaling, that the animals are not able to respond to differences in methionine or can't sense the level of methionine in the diet. Um, when we reduced it by 50% or increased it by 50%, we saw a similar, uh, very similar pattern to the <clears throat> to the Ames dwarf. We saw an increase, or that the the growth hormone mutant, in this case the receptor knockout, maintained its extension of lifespan, uh, both median and maximum, in comparison to the wild type. And then the last animal model that we looked at again was this growth hormone transgenic. Here we can see with the methionine restriction, the growth hormone transgenics in blue, it was not living as long as the wild type, but you have to remember that both animals were seeing an ex extension in their previous lifespan. We didn't have an ad or a child control on here, but we saw an increase of six months in lifespan extension in the growth hormone transgenic, um, where they normally live 365 days, they normally live a year, they were living to 18 months now. So, and then the wild type were extended. Um, similarly, the um, animals that were had re received reduced methionine or the enriched methionine didn't alter, so they weren't altered in comparison to their normal lifespan. But we um, said both the, both the transgenic and the wild type. So again, it suggested that all the wild type animals that we looked at and the growth hormone transgenic were able to um, sense or determine that there was a change in methionine in terms of restricted. Uh, level in comparison to the growth hormone receptor knockouts and the aims to work didn't seem to sense the differences. And this is just, this is the same data but just uh, presented differently showing the genotypes themselves. This was the aims to work animals on all three diets and the growth hormone receptor knockouts on all three diets. You see there's no differences. And then the growth hormone transgenic is shown here. So the restricted diet, you can see the extension in lifespan in comparison to the um, low levels in the thionine and the enriched levels, and then these are the wild type controls. So these three, there are these four groups responded similarly, and these two groups responded similarly. And so this is just, um, just I'll point out a couple of things. This is the pathology, and we just did a, we did gross pathology of these animals at death. And there's a couple of things to point out. Um, so in terms of genotype differences, so we looked at liver, lung, kidney tumors, and then these animals all had some issues with enlarged bladders, um, primarily the growth hormone transgenics, we looked at it in all the animals. And we found that there, you know, there wasn't really any genotype effects in terms of the number of tumors, of the type of tumors, but you have to remember that the dwarf animals are living twice as long as the wild types. So we're looking at 36 to 40 month old dwarf animals and you're looking at 20 to 25 month old wild type animals. So again, they, they have similar pattern in tumors, but it, it's um, just delayed much, much longer. It doesn't occur for a lot longer. So that's why we, there was a, pretty much a lack of differences, um, in genotype differences in terms of tumors. They also tend to have less. But, and then you can see that the diet didn't have a huge effect except in the liver. It appeared that um, increasing concentrations of methionine potentially increased the number of tumors um, in the liver. So that was that's the the uh, Ames dwarf. This is the um, growth hormone receptor knockouts. We did see a genotype difference here. Again, it's hard to exactly compare them because uh, chronologically they're very different um, time points. And then there was a little bit of a diet effect in terms of, of liver tumors, also increasing um, with increasing concentrations of methionine. And then these are the growth hormone transgenics down here. And you can see that the incidence, the number of animals with tumors, um, the transgenics are in white, is, is increased um, percentage-wise in comparison to the wild type. But again, the wild type are much older. They're twice as old, at least twice as old as the uh, growth hormone transgenics. And then to kind of to bring it full circle to look at methyltransferase activity in the presence of low methionine and high methionine, we looked at the DNA methyltransferase enzymes again. In, and this is in the dwarf mouse only. We haven't finished 
the data collect or the data analysis for the other genotypes. You can see that there's an increase overall in DNMT1. Uh, this is message expression, DNMT3A and DNMT3B in the dwarfing comparison. So again, they're still showing similar um, changes or direction of change in terms of methylation enzymes in comparison to the wild type, and they maintain that on these different diets of methionine. So what we've been able to show then is in the absence of growth hormones, such as the Ames dwarf, the Snell dwarf, the, um, and the, the growth hormone receptor knockout has growth hormone, but it just can't respond to it. So it's more a, reduce, a reduction or the absence of growth hormone signaling, you see an increase in methionine metabolism. This increases methyltransferase activity, not only the DNA methyltransferases, but other methyltransferases. We believe this increases the maintenance of the DNA methylation pattern throughout life. So this is what we're working on really hard right now to show these animals have a greater epigenetic stability throughout life um, in comparison to wild type animals. It also increases cysteine availability and we can see that by looking at just a variety of different thiol compounds that are within the system. We know that GSH is higher. I didn't talk about some of these other ones, but we know that many other thiol-related compounds are upregulated in these animals in comparison to the wild type. And again, we think that contributes to this um, metabolic reprogramming and that things are shifted from, instead of growth in the dwarf mouse, things are shifted towards cellular protection. So in conclusion, we believe that growth hormone status really impacts methionine metabolism, um, regardless of what the dietary methionine intake is, we think that growth hormone is involved in the ability of the system to sense methionine levels in the diet. There's some old literature in and the animal science literature suggesting that the growth hormone system is selectively sensitive to methionine um, specifically be, uh, to ensure that the drive to grow is modulated not by the general amino acid um, availability, but the one the amino acid that's least available in the, in the uh, nutrient supply. <clears throat> so we've, we found that quite interesting. So growth hormone negatively impacts methionine and glutathione pathways and uh, contributes to overall defense mechanisms. And at least in the growth hormone deficient animals, we haven't, we haven't finished work with the growth hormone receptor knockouts yet, but at least in these animals that have um, very low growth hormone signaling, they're able to maintain their methylation patterns better, and we think this may contribute to their longevity. And the issue, one of the issues at hand is that growth hormone is being promoted as an anti-aging factor, yet it suppresses your antioxidative defense mechanisms, it lowers other defense mechanisms, and we believe it alters DNA methylation, so, so we're kind of anti-growth hormone in our laboratory. Anyway, I thank you very much. Thank you so much for the award. That was a big surprise, and I will take any questions if there's time. Um, yes, there is time because we are actually perfectly on time. So, any questions? Yes, Edward. So, thank you for presenting. It's uh, exceptional to see the life extensions you obtain in mice and. Uh, I am not aware of such uh, life extensions otherwise. Um, uh, but uh, well, the, the mice are dwarf, right? Mm -hmm. um, and there are similar works. Uh, I remember in Paris, uh, Martin Altsenberger with the IGF-1 receptor uh, uh, mutants mm -hmm. uh, that were apparently not dwarf, not uh, specifically uh, uh, small or, or ill, that were living a little longer, not as long as here. And in the same line, uh, do you have in mind to, for example, uh, make some uh, uh, genetic changes that could be uh, done at adulthood with a PROP1? Uh, or to give some drugs uh, that are given to uh, acromegalia uh, patients uh, that reproduce uh, in a way, a uh, partial way, uh, what those mice have? Okay, so... Um, um it, regarding the drugs that you can use, so there's a there's that drug called um, Somavert, which antagonizes growth hormone action in humans, and they use it for acromegaly or, am, or humans that have pituitary pituitary um, tumors that produce a ton of hormones, of growth hormone in particular, and these individuals develop hypertension and and 
left ventricular hypertrophy and diabetes and die early. We've been trying to, we have to fill out MTA agreements with the drug company and with John Kopchik who created the, um, the drug and that it's, it's becoming difficult. <laughs> They'll only give us a plasmid that we have to grow up and produce our own. So we have looked into that and we're kind of working on it, but it's a very, very mm -hmm. slow process because we figure if we can reduce growth hormone signaling, at different age groups that we might might or might not see the same thing. But what we really believe is that it's this early lack of growth hormone signaling which is what is producing these effects because Andre Bartke's lab and a couple others have reintroduced growth hormone by injection at this point and they can shorten lifespan. And so that's why I didn't talk about prolactin and thyroid stimulating hormones so much because they've replaced the prolactin and there's no difference in lifespan. And they've replaced uh, thyroxin primarily, and you get a little bit of an extent, or a little bit of a decrease in lifespan, but when you give back growth hormone, it brings it right back to normal levels again, the lifespan, similar to wild type animals. So the focus has been on growth hormone. So I mean, just, uh, uh, what about PROP1? I mean, so, I, I yeah, Bill Sontag's group is actually okay. creating um, these conditional mutants yes. that they can, they can shut off growth hormone after adolescence. I think you have to shut it off earlier, actually. <laughs> but in humans and in mice and other mammals, growth hormone goes down naturally with age anyway. So at about age 30 in humans, growth hormone starts to climb several percent per decade so that you're down to maybe 25 to 30 to 40 percent of the levels you were during youth. And this is probably biologically important <coughs> to reduce um, prol proliferative activity such as cancer, is the guess. But no, that's, it's an excellent idea, but there's a couple other labs working on that. Um, so the, thank you for an interesting talk. I was quite interested with all you know, the effects you observed in lifespan and aging. Um, my question is, as you're sure you're aware, one of the issues that emerge in the field, and particularly concerning caloric restriction, is that there seems to be quite variable effects depending on mouse strain. So the question is, I presume you use black sex, but that's one of the questions. Which strain do you use? And um, I guess, has anyone done the similar, the same mutations in other mouse strains, and do you observe similar or uh, the same effect? So we did not use black six. Um, so the, the dwarf gene um, is on a heterogeneous background. So these animals were developed by some geneticists years ago, not developed. Spontaneous mutation arose that was published the first time in 1961. It was crossed onto various different backgrounds throughout that time. And when Anje got it, it was on this heterogeneous background. And he kept the colony closed after that. And so I've had it, I have the same group of mice that he has. They're on a varied background, um, and so they're not on black six. The growth hormone transgenics are on a half black six background, a C3H black six, and the growth hormone um, receptor knockout animals are also not on black six because they don't reproduce very well on that background, because that C C57 animals have issues with breeding and mothering and a variety of different things. So they, they, they are available on a black six background and they still live longer, um, and Arlen Richardson has put the Ames mice on a black six background and they still live longer, so the longevity effect is real. But in terms of these other studies, um, in terms of the methionine restriction, we don't know if there's strain differences because that hasn't been published, if, if that's you know, kind of what you're getting at. But, we, but I think people are moving away from putting all, or doing everything on a black six background now because we're not seeing the effects of all those of the calorie restriction, like you said, they see it in the black six, but they don't see it on all strains. Um, and so they're kind of, at least the most recent things that I've heard and people talking about is they're trying to move away from the black six uh, somewhat because everything's so concentrated on that background right now and it has its own issues. So I don't know if that answers your question, but. Okay, any more questions? Now these very interesting animals which mm -hmm. live longer mm -hmm. and they are healthier. Mm -hmm. So in nature, why didn't they become the wild type? Ah, well, there's a lot. There's a few things. <laughs> when you compete them with wild type, they will lose out, like nematodes. Let say, why? They're, what is the price of this, basically? They're hypothermic, so they're about a degree and a half lower than wild type animals. We don't do anything husbandry wise different. Some people keep them with other animals to keep them warm, but we don't do that. We've never done that, <laughs> and, they're, and they do just fine. So, um, but we know that they're more, they're, they have increased disease resistance too, because they've been challenged. Um, so we don't think it's that, I think it's the hypothermia. Um, 
they wouldn't survive very long outdoors, nor would any any laboratory mouse. But they're colder, and so that, and so that's another thing I can bring up to you is that they have been. Uh, Barkey's lab has recently published a paper showing that if they raise the temperature um, in these animals and the growth hormone receptor knockout, they tend to be a little bit cooler also, that you lose some of the lifespan effect because the temp when you raise the temperature up to 30, which is thermal neutral for, for mice. So right now we grow mice at 22 degrees, which is comfortable for humans, but it's not thermal neutral for, for mice. And so that impacts everybody's work. <laughs> All the metabolic work and biochemical work is being impacted by raising mice at lower body temperatures, and specifically aging. From nature and evolution's point of yep. view, they are not good animals. Mm -hmm. They are not evolved. Right, animals. right. But we know that the, we know with the Ecuadorian dwarfs, we know that they lived normal lifespans um, in comparison to their wild type controls. Their relatives primarily is what they use for the control. Um, but they don't have any diabetes and cancer, but they do die from some other interesting things, like there's a lot of accidents. <laughs> so we don't know if it's because these shorter individuals are taking more risks. That could be one explanation. And the other thing is that, the, that they live in the mountains, and the, the stairs are quite tall. <laughs> and so Walter said that they have a lot of falling accidents and die versus dying from cancer or, or diabetes. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's other populations of dwarfs. Um, there's one that has the same mutation as the Ames dwarf, population of individuals off the coast of Croatia. They also live to normal lifespans. There's not very many people because it's a very small population, but they, they um, with the exception of reproduction, they live a normal lifespan, have the same type of jobs as their relatives and things, so they're not cognitively impaired or anything. Any other questions? Well, um, it's um, interesting. Uh, last year, there, I think it was a, a paper in PNES where the temperature of uh, the room where the mice were gone impacted cancer research. So yeah, anyone who isn't aware of that work might want to look at that. Uh, any more questions? No? Great. Thank no you questions? Again. Okay. Thank you. Uh,